All right. Thanks, Quinn, for turning your camera on. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Terry is the only bad one today, but we'll give him grace since he's on crutches. Oh, there you go. He had to get a hat. That's what it was. <laughs> All right. So, fellas, this is about jumpstarting 2023. So let me ask. Like what? What was? Uh, what would you like to get out of this session? Uh, me personally, I would like to kind of you know get your perspective on you know what or how you kind of business plan, you know, for the uh, upcoming year. Okay. Um. What else? Think. I guess like you know how much time you would in, um, you know, prospecting for us like door knocking, um, calling expired listings and, um, yeah, you know, really just, you know, kind of just hear your thoughts. Okay. I would say, I think, cause the market shifting and, and people's thoughts, you know, the different strategies that are going to be probably more successful next year than they have been the last two years and how to have those conversations with, with buyers or sellers okay. or people that um, are certain that they know what's happening with the market and that they're right. I just want to make a plan and goals with other people and just see <clears throat> how everybody's doing it as well. All right, so I'm going to jump around a little bit on this. Um, my whole vision, of, and we haven't done this since 2020, but I'm a firm believer of what you were doing to 60 to 90 days ago is a direct result of where you're at right now. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I know sometimes you just get lucky and you get a deal, and but generally you don't have a lucky month with four deals that fall in your lap. Um, but my goal for this, which does not have to be your goal, um, was to create two levels of accountability groups. And I know we have um, brokers that are very interested in doing something. So Connor is already a part of our accountability. Terry's already a part of uh, a different accountability but if that's something you would like to be a part of, let me know. Because my goal was to create to uh, one of a higher level and um, you know, 250,000 GCI or above and then one below. So I'm gonna go through my spiel a little bit, um, but it sounds like you guys are, are here for kind of different reasons and that's totally okay. I'll address those as well. So to finish out the year strong, part of it is just having a level of accountability. And, and I know, and I say this with love, and I'm not talking to anyone in particular, real estate is impossible to do by yourself. It just is. Because having people around that are in a similar conversation, that have a growth mindset, that talk about what's going on, even me, who I've been around for many, many years, every Monday and Tuesday, I ask as many questions as I can so I can really stay relevant with what's going on in the market. And if you're off in your own little world, that's really hard to do. Um, so to finish out the year strong, the number one question you have to ask yourself is where are you right now? Are you in alignment with your goal that you set at the beginning of the year? If you're not, which is totally fine. Remember a goal was not there. Oh, there's a quote that I'm going to fumble, but basically it was from Bruce Lee. Hold on one second. I got to pull it up. 
Bruce Lee said a goal is not always meant to be reached. It often serves simply as something to aim at. So in two and a half weeks, two weeks and one day, we're entering the fourth quarter. So now you have to say, where am I at today? And do I need to redefine my goals for the rest of the year? It's totally okay to redefine your goals. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't redefine them to be too comfortable, okay? Remember, a goal is something to aim at. You're trying to stretch yourself. And then you have to say, okay, what do I need to change? If, I'm, if you're on track, that's awesome. If you're off track, that's awesome too. It's okay. But what do I need to do differently? Where do I need to focus my time? What are my big challenges? And sometimes you can't change your challenge. Like I love my kids to pieces, but if they were at the age they are, I could work a whole lot more. But I have to work smarter and I have to be very clear about my intention of what I'm doing. And I do have the time. It's about quality, not quantity. Does that make sense? So you have to clear the clutter away and just get real with yourself. Questions or comments so far? Okay, so there's some basics that you have to have to jumpstart where you are. If everybody would like to turn their camera on, it would make my heart happy, but no pressure. Who here has a written out schedule? Nice job, Quinn. So everyone should have a written out schedule. If you don't, know where you want to go and you don't know how you're going to get there, that's kind of a challenge to meet or exceed your goals. Now, remember, a schedule is not in cement, okay? It's almost like a goal. It gives you something to aim for. So if you have a schedule and you do 90% on Monday and 40% on Tuesday and 80% on Wednesday, you're accomplishing so much more because it's the compound effect, okay? So Quinn is the rock star who has a schedule. Who has a marketing plan? Good job, Connor. So I would really, really suggest that everyone gets very clear on their marketing plan. Who are you sending what to whom, how often? And then here's the kicker. Does your marketing plan include video? That's really big. Terry Vo. This is a great time for you to like, you could do videos up the kazoo right now. Just remember, like Connor said, we're in a shifting market, things are changing. So you're gonna have to change what you've been doing. As the market shifts, you have to shift along with it, okay? But these are some of the really core foundational pieces that you have to have with any business. Who here tracks their numbers weekly? So let me throw this monkey wrench at you. If you are not measuring your business Okay, your business, what feeds you, you're guessing. And I don't know about you in life, 
but I don't like to live my life that way. I like to be structured and know what's happening. Again, everybody talks about real estate being like this, but if you stick to some of these foundational pieces, your peaks and valleys will become ebb and flow. Does that make sense? Questions, comments? Statistically, 50 conversations equal one transaction. So if you have a goal to do 10 deals by the end of the year, how many conversations do you need to have? Five hundred. Okay. Who knows how many weeks? For, for me, days. probably a thousand. <laughs> well, you never know. Okay, so you need. So let's say you you have a goal to do ten deals by the end of the year. How many weeks until the end of the year? Sixteen, give or take. Okay, so let's just go with fifteen. I'm going to get my little calculator out because I'm not as smart as Connor. So if, now this is if you're working the week of Christmas, you're working the week of Thanksgiving, if you need 500 conversations and you divide it by 15, that means you need 33.3 solid real estate conversations a week. Now, I will know about you, but I don't know any brokers, not even the Jewish brokers that work the week of Christmas. It's a great time to work because nobody else is working, but <clears throat> you have to adjust for that. So if you're not going to work that week, now you're at 14 weeks. Now your number goes up. If you're not going to work the week of Thanksgiving, now that's 13 weeks. Now your number goes up. This is doing real estate like a business. Okay. Staying in your comfort zone will prevent you from growing. This is where you're like, oh, believe me, I'm one of the most anti-committal people you will ever meet. It took me like 20 years to get married. I'm like to the same person. <laughs> but a schedule will set you free. A schedule will allow for flexibility because you're building in your time every day for lead generation. So someone had a question, Quinn, <coughs> how much time should you be spending door knocking, calling expireds, that type of thing? Let's open it up for discussion, okay? How much time do you spend prospecting and how much time should you spend prospecting? Terry. Oh, you're muted. I spend about an hour to two hours a day prospecting. So making phone calls with my sphere or just uh, calling, uh, just calling anybody. I would say for a newer broker, two hours a day, no questions about it. That means if you're not going to work on Friday, you need to prospect four hours on Thursday. Who has read the book Compound Effect? So I'll give it to you in a nutshell. You don't get lung cancer from smoking a cigarette. You don't get lung cancer for smoking 20 cigarettes a week for two weeks. You get lung cancer by smoking a little bit every day, year after year after year. I know that's like a horrible sad, but, but it, it makes sense. So building a business, Terry, and don't feel like you have to if you don't want to. What award did you receive last year for your production? Um, I forgot. 
<laughs> I <laughs> actually do. <laughs> yeah. So Terry it's, got Terry got the award that was one down from top one percent. Chairman's Circle, five hundred thousand GCI or greater. So, how many years have you been in the business? Five years. At John L. Scott. Yeah. Okay. So, but I would say Terry's probably one of the most coachable brokers because he just does what he's supposed to. <clears throat> Excuse me. But a successful business has structure and a plan and consistent lead generation. Now let's talk about lead generation. Who here markets to their database? You all better have your hands up. Database is your number one source of business. Do you have a marketing plan with your database? Do you know how often you're going to call them? How often they're, you're going to mail them? Are you doing an event with your database? Now, those of you that have known me for a while know that I am very, very frugal. So you can do events all different kinds of ways. Connor does, correct me if I'm wrong, Connor does a food drive every year, correct? About how much does that cost you? Um, I normally do like one or two baskets, so like a hundred bucks. Okay. And you see a good amount of people? Yeah, especially the first year. And you're helping the community? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any kind of community fundraising event where your clients are bringing something is huge. You could do, I'm doing a pumpkin patch event this year. You can get a lender to sponsor it. You, I mean, there's so many different things you can do. Um, I used to do poker parties all the time. Seahawk parties. Not necessarily a client event, but you're putting events together. You're seeing people, you are connecting with people. That's really big. But again, how much attention are you paying to your intention? How many of you send out an annual equity review? Send out a CMA every year to everyone in your database. Uh, wow. Monthly. What's that? Monthly, like a monthly equity update. HomeBot doesn't count yet. <laughs> that's, that's my next point. That doesn't <laughs> count, Terry. But if you want to be looked at as the professional, the person that knows about homes and selling and buying and value, I would, my financial planner, I get something like every quarter with where I'm at with all the stuff that I don't understand. And honestly, I don't really pay too much attention to it. But if he didn't send it to me, I'd be like, uh oh, why? What's going on? So that is a really powerful thing that you can do with your database. You could do it on cloud CMA, make it really, really nice. If you want to be a rock star, drop it off at their house. The second best thing to do is to mail it, but I understand some people are on a budget. If you absolutely have to, you can email it, but What's the open rate? Standard open rate of email right now, I think it's like 30%. Second, 
who is taking advantage of free buy side, where it's sending out a female campaign to your people about the value of their home, or like what Terry does, which I think is way better than buy side, but it's $25 a month for 500 people. It will send out um, the same thing as buy side. It is just a whole lot better than buy side. It's way more interactive and you can see what the open rates are. Are you, yes, Connor. Oh, I thought you were pausing to see who does. Oh, do you do HomeBot? Yeah, I do HomeBot. Nice. Mm -hmm. Who's sending out just listed, just pending, and just sold like on steroids? Not these little BS postcards, but like good, solid marketing. Rache Boston just got an $800,000 buyer because one of her clients that lived in the neighborhood got a really awesome just listed letter. And it was like, hey, we just listed the home on 123 Banana Street. We're doing a private um, viewing for neighbors at this time. We apologize if there's any extra traffic on the road, blah, 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 blah. And her guy seen it and called her up and said, hey, I, we weren't planning on moving and staying in the same neighborhood, but we, we want to make an offer. I mean, that's a $24,000 commission. Who is offering classes to their database? Now, remember to maximize yourself. If you are getting everything ready for how to sell your home class, why don't you do a few videos while it's all fresh in your head and kill two birds with one stone while the conversation is fresh. Investment properties. Don't get in your head about interest rates. I'm thinking about buying a rental right now. <clears throat> I'm not real happy about 6% interest, but ah, I've had it worse. Buyer classes. Talk to lenders who has a zero down loan program. Pros and cons of whatever. People love pros and cons videos. Case studies. We put this home on the market and there was a shift and this is what happened. Questions, comments? But ask yourself, really, and I know agents hate this question <clears throat> and you don't ever have to answer me, but how many hours a week are you really, really working? And we just came out of a market where people there's somebody here in this office that made between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars last year, and he worked 25 to 30 hour weeks. And we're just not in that market anymore. Now we got to get back to work. So then you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do to stay in this conversation? Accountability group, pain, pleasure, readiness tracker, <clears throat> schedule. What do you need to help you continuing to move forward to achieve your goal? All right, just a few more things. <clears throat> And I think this is a huge one. Do you have a relevant market opinion based 
on facts. If you are my go-to agent and I say, what's going on in the market? If you are doom and gloom, that's what you're spreading out there. So make sure you have a relevant opinion. And then when you have that opinion, do a video about it. Do you know that 2020 and 2021 were anomaly years. That was a crazy historic market. It was so much fun, but it was pretty crazy. Who knows the national average appreciation of a home? Isn't it like supposed to be like 4%? 3.8, very nice. So if you have people that are like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. Home prices are going down. Show them where home prices are to January to May. In King County, the average home went up 18%. And, and that's in five months. Who cares if it dropped 10%? You still went up 8%. So you have to make sure you're very relevant with the things that you're saying. Questions, comments? You guys are a lively bunch, huh? I'll add one thing about the relevant part. Um, to look at the long game, like I know all of you are, are fairly new. Um, over the last 20 years, we've had dips. Both Shai and I were in the market in 2008. Yes, it dipped down, but it went right back up. So that's another thing just to think about as you were looking at this dip is historically, we've always gone up even through the down downturns. And whether or not you own a home, think about when you move. People generally move because they have to. I don't know about you, but unless I'm upgrading, I don't move because I like to pack and move. So remember, as you're talking to people and you see life changes, that's when people have to move. So I'm going to share my screen. Now I'm going to be doing a full class on this as we get a little bit later into the year, but um, all right. So you guys see this wheel here? This to me, I probably do this two or three times a year. This for me is just a great check on myself of, am I putting my time where I want to and where I need to? So this is a really powerful piece here. The other piece, and I'll have you guys focus more on this, but where is your business coming from? That's going to help you get very clear about what you need to increase and maximize what's working best for you. And then maybe some areas that you need to improve on. You should also be asking yourself, what are your pillars of business? If what you've been doing, if you've been living on your database, you need to figure out how to incorporate more pillars. Questions, comments? 
Everybody's getting so carried away here. Y'all watching Netflix. All right. So Quinn, any specific questions you had regarding business planning? Uh, no, I think like uh, kind of what you're already going over is definitely helping me out. Okay. And, um, yeah. And I will do a business planning class, um, probably late October, early November, probably later October. Um, it's really hard your first or second year, I think, to do a business planning class um, to the full extent, just because you're still figuring out where to maximize your time and where business is coming from. Um, but I mean, Terry, Terry would be a really great example. I don't know of any broker that has really taken off in our business and still, and most of their business, business hasn't come from database. Was that your experience, Terry? Yeah, I started out not focusing on my database at all because most of my database wanted like, they already knew other agents or had agents or wanted a discount. So I kind of focused on somebody outside my database. And then until they started seeing me doing better, that's when my database started, um, uh, what is it, focusing and going towards me. So I did it kind of opposite. So how long do you think it took you in order for like your database to kind of fully trust you? Um, I would say the first, I mean, as long as you start advertising your deals and just making sure that you're out there doing your marketing, your social media, your Instagram, as long as they keep seeing that you're doing well, that's when they start asking questions to you. Uh, about it and then once you talk to them and then started taking them out going to eat and creating that relationship that's when they start gravitating towards you gotcha so i'm gonna jump in <clears throat> i know it seems like we all talk for a living and that's probably what we're all really good at but when i'm talking to a seller about a price i need to show them a cma i need to show them data if I'm trying to get my database to associate me with real estate, to perceive me as the expert, I need to show them. I need to do evidence of success. I need to show them on my social media. When you're doing open houses, when you're showing homes, you're dripping this information and they're like, oh, wow, he's back out there again. Oh, look at, he sold another house. So you can't just speak it. You have to have different, um, different ways to communicate it. That's a phenomenal book. Seven Levels of Communication is a fantastic book, but you have to show people what you're doing. Connor, you talked about different strategies and conversations. Can you clarify a little bit more about that? Yeah, I guess I just watched like this morning and yesterday, a lot of Annie Fitzsimmons, like latest videos and series about, um, you know, the forums and all of that. But I just think in general like having conversations and like showing value like there's one video uh where she and whoever was like it's hard for brokers sometimes to express their value to other people other than making it seem like oh you're just you know writing up a contract and um it's good to go and it's super simple and easy and i think that's definitely something i struggle with is like expressing my value because like obviously i've done deals now so i understand what goes into the process but i'm still sometimes struggling okay like what am i actually doing that's difficult that other people can't necessarily do so what makes me unique in a sense 
You know, it's funny you said that just because I have that written like right here in my notes. What makes you unique? Mm -hmm. Okay, so unmute if you want to participate. Help Connor, because y'all hear me talk all the time. Help Connor. How do you identify what makes you unique, your value proposition? Well, I'm going to start <laughs> um, with Connor. You have a background in finance and have a way of looking at people's like, like even when we talked about with Sarah Simon, looking at someone who doesn't have much earnest money and helping them strategize on up. And like, that's something that I could never bring to the table. And it's, you take it for granted because it's just the way your mind works, but that's a huge skill um, an asset that you bring to every buyer and seller, just your, your background of finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. But I think like our office too, we have so much training that other offices do. You guys are, uh, you know, miles ahead of other brokers without even knowing it um, in terms of the, your understanding of contracts and negotiation. Thank you. I think that there's so many things that you're going to be like, not ah, shy, that doesn't matter, but it does. That if you're working with a buyer, I'm going to try to pull something up last minute here. I don't even know where it's at. We'll see. If you're working with a buyer, are you strategic? Um, are you an expert negotiator? Are you punctual? Because I don't know about you, but if I hire a professional that doesn't respect my time, done. Do you show up ready to go? Are you prepared when you are meeting with someone? There's so many brokers that run in here late and their clients are sitting in the lobby and they look like their hair's on fire. How do people perceive you? Are you the professional? Um, this is really, really cheesy, but I've used it for years. And this is the piece I use, <coughs> excuse me, before I present a buyer agency agreement. And I'm like, I promise to show you only the homes you want and not waste your time. I promise to work around your schedule and spend as much time with you as you wish. Be timely, take care of details promptly and to be thorough, keep you informed, get your questions answered, patient, understanding, trustworthy, honest, not to be pushy. Like, see miracles happen. I cannot be pushy a good negotiator and get you into your new home. And then I say, and this is what I expect of you. Only purchase a home with me. Call me for information on an advertisement. Keep cards in your wallet or purse to hand out if you go to an open house. If you go to new construction, sign me in as your broker and talk to me if you have any questions or concerns. And I always sign it and then my next piece is my buyer agency agreement. So you could do something along these lines, but people want to know what you're gonna do up front. I think, Connor, this is why it's so important to go through the steps of buying a home or selling a home because that's the piece where you can use real estate jargon and you talk about seller disclosure and the importance of it and home inspection. That right there, that piece of the conversation and how detailed you are and how passionate you are is going to, instead of giving them your resume, that's going to show leaps and bounds what you're about and create so much trust. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, it does. And I like that rent agreement thing that you just showed up. That was pretty unique. 
Yeah. And I mean, when people, I'm a big believer in having your story. And Connor, you have a great story. I mean, you're like this awesome, you were an awesome student. You're, I don't, I don't know enough to sell it, but like super into this robotics business thing. And then you started your own business selling homes. You're this entrepreneur. And then you just closed on your first home at age 25 with like an extraordinary couch. So it's one of those things where when you're connecting with people and you're passionate about where you are and what you're doing, and then you explain things in detail because it matters to you that your people understand what's going on, that is what makes you unique. Because a lot of brokers don't care and they're just trying to zip right through it. Questions, comments, thoughts. That was helpful for me. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? So nobody has to answer right now because I have a group of brokers that I am going to be reaching out to. Um, I know some of you are part of a weekly group. But I would challenge you, if you want, only if you want, to say, okay, I want to be a part of like a True Blue accountability group. And basically, this is what it would mean. Okay. I need your why. I need to know what your goal is, why you're doing this. Why do you want me to kick you in your ass? Because that's what I love to do. What is your schedule? What is your weekly accountability? What I mean by that is, are you doing a greatness tracker? There is a, another piece that some brokers really like. I mean, I, I like the greatness tracker, but it's not for everybody. And you have to do what works for you. And I'm going to show this. So you fill this out. It's day one of 30, but it's here are your personal notes. Two affirmations a day, two daily gratitudes. What are your action items? Meetings, calls to sphere. What are you doing for positive mindset? How many people are you adding to database? Adding to your database is very, very important that a lot of people just overlook because they're like, oh, I created it, I have it, and I'm good to go. You should have a goal to add to your database X amount every week. Who's ready to buy or sell now? Who's ready to buy or sell in three months? Social events, internet, update, Facebook, Zillow, buyer consultations, seller presentations, <clears throat> market insights, open houses, valuation updates, and then things you've learned today. So this is really great. It's pretty in depth, but you should be tracking your numbers somehow because if you're not tracking, you're guessing. And then I'd want your marketing plan. And then what happens if you do it or you don't do it? There are some agents that say, okay, I want to do a $20 buy-in or a $50 buy-in or a $100 buy-in. And then whoever does meets their goals at the end gets the pot or it's donated. Or, and this, I love this, we've had a few guys in the past that if they didn't meet their goals, um, they had to go out in the parking lot and wash a couple cars 
That's a super fun one. So you need some kind of friendly pressure to keep you on track to ensure that you hit your goals. So again, nobody has to answer right now, but you can get back to me and let me know if that's something you wanna do. Um, and then I'm gonna reach out to a few other people that couldn't make it today. Where can I find that form that you just showed? I will email it to you. Great, thank you. All right, what else? You have me and Katie, your full attention. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna say for this session, <laughs> the Annie Fitzsimmons meeting is on September, <clears throat> excuse me, September 28th. Terry, I think you've probably known me the longest, maybe Sarah. And this is one of the most important meetings you'll ever attend. Well, for right now. The forms changes that are coming up are real doozy. And Katie and I went to a session yesterday with Justin Haig and Jeannie Simpson, the attorneys for MLS. And I gotta tell you, I, I was a little like, wow, I can't believe this is all happening. So on the 28th, I don't care what you have going on. I will push you in, Terry Bo. <laughs> we'll get a little cart for you. <laughs> but it's one of those sessions that you need to clear your schedule and you need to be there. So I meet at your place then? Absolutely, pre-funk at Shy's house. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm a horrible nurse though. <laughs> All right, anything else? I guess I have a question for Terry then, because I feel like I was or in, in a current like similar position where all but, because I just looked at my past deals, all but two, or only two deals that I've done have come from my database. Um, the rest have come from people that I've met since becoming licensed. So was like the big shift or transition for you just showing people in your database, like you are successful and putting it out there more, or did you change marketing conversations, anything like that? So... I think after they started seeing you doing deals and you are like a legit broker, um, that's when you start, they'll start asking you about questions. And then that's when I think you can start marketing to them, like more of like showing your face, taking them out to eat, creating a relationship with them. And then eventually that's when they trust you a little bit more. And then, you know, they start telling, you know, other people that, you know, within the uh, your group, your sphere. So I say it took about maybe like a year or two, then everything shifted over to the database because that's when they just, uh, you fi finally solidify that you're a legit broker and not somebody that's just doing it like, you know, like moonlighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Terry, can you go one step further? Now you're saying, okay, once they see you doing deals, Mm -hmm. How did they see that? What did you do to cause your database to see you doing deals? So I do a lot of um, everybody that I want to either target or get involved with. I go on their Instagram and kind of do my social media stories and just do the deals and all that stuff. And then um, sometimes I, um, if, if I want to target them a little bit, I usually just look at their um their Instagram stories and kind of slide into their DM that way and then just say hello or whatever it is. And then when they're talking to you, you know, they're looking at your stories as well too. So then they see that you're doing, you know, pretty well or doing, and then they'll, they'll just keep seeing, as long as you keep showing that you're doing some type of uh, real estate, you're either showing uh, data or some type of post about real estate. I think that's gonna, you know, shift their mindset that is like, okay, this guy's a real deal. I'm doing 
you know, real estate and not just, uh, you know, doing one or two deals a year. So. And I think for you, Connor, the fact that you bought a place over here, that right there is social proof to people that you, um, that you're, that you're doing something that you're, that you're successful. Yeah. Um, and I use quotes cause there's, you know, yeah. all, all of us have different definitions, but I think especially marketing your database and then even parents of your peers, because there's a little healthy competition of like Connor did this on his own. Um, maybe I want to like help my kids so they can be where Connor is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you're, uh, you're practicing what you preach. You know, you're telling people to buy houses, sell houses. And if you don't own one yourself, then it's kind of like, you know, uh, but you do have one now, so it's like good that you do. Yeah, thank you. It, and then you have to, like, I think just because I was in your shoes, I mean, I started selling by myself when I was just turned 22, right around 22. And, and I bought my first house. And then I'm like, okay, how do they perceive me? And my friends so much of the time were not my low hanging fruit because they were still in college or finding themselves. I needed to go after their parents. And I have a lot of clients. I have a good handful of clients that I haven't talked to their kids since graduation day, but I've done all of that. <clears throat> now for me, they always see me as a really good student. So whenever I would go see them or door knock or whatever, I would always be dressed professionally because I needed them to see me as older because I didn't want to be associated with, I have a kid your age. And so no matter what, that, that for me, I'm not saying for you, but that was something for me is I didn't want to be perceived as the kid, even if I was the kid that owned the house. Um, so you just have to, like, I don't think there's one golden answer. It's a few of these all tied together. Mm -hmm. All right. Remember, you can thrive in any market with the right playbook. So ask yourself what your playbook looks like. Nobody thought the Hawks were going to win on Monday, except me and Katie, but they had the right playbook. All right. Anything else? Any other classes or sessions that you guys would like to see that you think would be beneficial or helpful to you? All right. Well, fun. We'll have a great Thursday. And uh, if you guys need any help, just reach out to Katie or myself. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.